My name is Mickey Cochran. I'm here to introduce you to the mandolin. What a perfect day to go inside and study the mandolin.
Greetings, my name is Mickey Cochran, and I'm here to introduce you to the mandolin. I can only hope that you'll find my approach to teaching simple and thorough. This video consists of an instructional course that emphasizes method first and learning song second. The final run will be to have a strong foundation in mandolin technique. Playing with confidence within any musical setting is a tremendous goal. Therefore, this is a methodology course of exercises and technique builders to further your playing capabilities and hopefully help you become a well-rounded accomplished mandolin. The point I'm trying to make here is that we're not going to focus so much on just learning song after song like so many videos and books do teach. What we want to do is establish a foundation through exercises and study and uh, certainly taking a methodical approach and ensuring that you have the technique and facility before you move on to difficult songs and passages. Since you are a beginner, I encourage you to take this course slowly. This course was designed to keep things as simple as possible. There will be times when you feel that the learning process has become too difficult. This usually means you are attempting to advance too quickly. Do not attempt to rush ahead from chapter to chapter. I want you to be inspired enough to practice daily, and upon your efforts in practicing, you'll find the lessons become easier. The lessons to follow are cumulative. Each lesson will be fully supported by previous lessons, which will give you a stair-step advancement that will, at the very least, minimize frustration. While I want your learning process to be enjoyable, I also want to hold your interest by introducing some mandolin melodies in the video. It's not going to be all exercises and all technique builders, but those are important before attempting your first melody. So we will be methodically approaching this so that when we come up to the first melody you'll be playing, it's going to be less frustrating for you to learn. The exercise I will be introducing will seem tedious at first. However, when we go to tackle our first song together, you will find it far easier than without the exercises. By keeping in mind that this is a methodology approach, hopefully you will have focus and determination. Enjoy the journey, for mastering the mandolin is a lifetime process. So, onward to our first chapter, where we will discuss the parts of a mandolin, how and why they fit together, and the importance of proper setup. I'd like to discuss with you the mandolin, its construction, and its history. This way, you have somewhat of a perspective on its past, and it may just help you as you play through the future. The mandolin has been around as an eight-string instrument in its current configuration for approximately 400 years. It's a direct descendant of the mandola, which is a descendant of the lute. And therefore, the mandolin itself is also a descendant of the lute. The mandola has a longer scale length. Longer scale length, meaning that from the bridge to the nut, it's quite a bit longer, which allows for a deeper voicing. So, in fact, the mandolin itself is derived from its shape. Here, if you look at it, the shape itself is similar to an almond. The Italian term mandorla, mandorla, translates to almond in English. The mandolin has gone through various phases of popularity and has been effectively incorporated into many genres of popular music, including, especially today, rock, jazz, ragtime, classical, and is heard very commonly in country and bluegrass settings. I encourage you to explore a variety of styles of music with your mandolin. To learn from all styles of music will only make you that much more rounded. Therefore, keep an open mind and explore as many venues as you can. This can only increase your musical perspective and, more importantly, will increase your facility with the mandolin itself. In our discussion of mandolin construction, what I'd like to discuss with you and to ensure that you have a full understanding of the mandolin in every respect is the parts of a mandolin. Let's start by discussing the neck area. Let's start with the frets here. If you come in real close, you'll notice that these horizontal lines are steel bars that are frets. These frets 
are what allow the string to ring true. Okay, when I fret, it's allowing that string to ring at the note of the fret. When, now in our discussion of frets, it's important that when you are fretting the instrument, um, that would be the verb version of the noun fret. That means you're placing your finger behind the fret directly. You don't want to press it in the middle or onto the back of it. You want to press it behind the fret directly when you're fretting the instrument. And these are frets, of course. Um, and Okay, with the frets, now these frets are embedded in the fingerboard. The fingerboard is usually made of rosewood or ebony, as in the case of this particular mandolin. This one's made of ebony. Okay, in our discussion of the neck, we also have what we call indicator dots. And these are on the top side of the neck. If you're looking at it while you're playing, you'll be able to use these indicator dots as a reference point of where you are during your playing efforts. Another part of the instrument that's very critical to its sound and serves also functionality would be the top. The top here is solid spruce. Most all mandolins are made with solid spruce tops. There are a few who use mahogany or maybe even cherry, and those are usually Celtic style instruments. In the case of a bluegrass instrument or an instrument that you're using for a variety of purposes, the most common top you'll find on a mandolin would be a solid spruce top. Let's talk about the back and sides. Back and sides are usually made of maple or mahogany woods. Now the mahogany woods on the back and sides of a mandolin would add warmth to the sound of the instrument, whereas the maple woods, such as on this Breedlove mandolin, adds more punch and brightness and crispness to the instruments, tonal range and quality. Let's talk about the tailpiece. The tailpiece serves functionality again by holding the strings in place. If you'll notice closely here, each one of these strings are looped around a hook on the tailpiece itself. There are many varieties of mandolin tailpieces. This is just one particular style of tailpiece, but uh, yours may have a loop style hook. There are many varieties of tailpieces on mandolins. This is one unique style tailpiece that is common to Breedlove mandolins. In, in, this, in our discussion of the tailpiece, we also have an end pin. The end pin serves functionality in that if you are standing up and using a strap or even sitting down and using a strap you would loop your strap around the end pin on this side of the instrument. In our discussion of using straps let's go for a wide shot here. In our discussion of using straps you also normally find an end pin or strap button that is on the heel of the neck. This is the heel of the neck. In our discussion of using straps, you would also find many strap buttons installed either on the heel cap or on the arc of the heel of the neck. This is the heel of the neck, okay, and you see the arc. You also have a heel cap. Now, it's also in our discussion about straps, this is where you would have your strap button installed on a mandolin. This particular mandolin does not have a strap button installed. If you are installing a strap button, I highly recommend going to a local instrument repair person, also called a luthier, who can assist you with doing it properly. Do not try to do it on your own. Now let's discuss the peg head. The peg head itself serves as a place for the tuning machines to be held into place. This particular peg head has gold hardware tuners and perloid buttons. Okay, on the tuning machines themselves, that, which are held in place by the peg head, you'll notice these are four in line on both sides of the peg head on the back side. Here we have what we call the mandolin bridge. This one is an adjustable bridge. You'll notice the thumb screws on both sides of the bridge that allows you to raise or lower your action. Okay. Here's what we call the mandolin bridge. This one has two thumb screws that allows you to raise the action. Action meaning distance 
of the strings from the fretboard. If the strings are relatively high off of the fretboard here, you'll notice that would be considered a high action. If the strings are closer to the fretboard, the fingerboard as we discussed earlier, that would be called a lower action. So the bridge itself is critical for adjusting action. There are many mandolins that, are, that do have bridges that are non-adjustable bridges. This bridge is also movable, meaning that it can be moved back and forth over the top of the mandolin, allowing you to adjust your intonation. Intonation is the proper adjustment of your bridge so that it's in direct it's in a correct distance from the nut to the bridge. Here we have the nut on the mandolin. Okay, This also serves functionality in that it holds the strings in place within their respective slots. Okay, And near the nut we have what you call a truss rod cover. If you notice the screw here is holding a truss rod cover which means that within the neck there is what we call a steel reinforcement rod called a truss rod. And that ensures that your neck stays straight and if it does have a warp to it in any way that it can be adjusted through behind the truss rod. It can be adjusted behind the truss rod cover. Again, I highly recommend that you visit your local luthier to have that kind of work done if your neck happens to be too warped to play. Here we have on the top of the mandolin what we call F holes. Many mandolins are made with oval holes which is a round circle in the center of the top. This, in this case this Breedlove mandolin has what we call F holes. In our discussion of mandolin construction on chapter one, I'd like to discuss with you the importance of proper setup with your mandolin. We discussed all the parts of the mandolin so that you are aware of the names of the parts. So if I mention a part of the mandolin, you will already know what I'm referring to. Now, on the bridge itself, in, again, in relationship to your nut of your mandolin, what you'll want to do is you'll want to make sure your bridge is properly placed on the top of your mandolin. If your bridge happens to be too close into the fingerboard, what you'll have is a sharp intonation, meaning that when we play our string open, and then what we're going to do is we're going to fret over here on the 12th fret. If that happens to be a sharp note, that means our intonation is incorrectly adjusted. So we'll need to adjust it properly by moving the bridge forward or backwards based on whether the note is sharp or flat. Now let's try this again. We're going to play the string open and then I'm going to fret it. Notice that note is exact. Now if this note happens to be sharp, now there's a lot of ways to reference this. You can use an electronic tuner if you want or if you already have a trained ear you can do this by ear. Now I'm hitting the note open, that's an E note. Now we're going to play the note and now that's a sharp note. What would I do if that's sharp? I move my bridge in a small increment back towards the tailpiece, just slightly back. Then I test it again and I listen to it open. Then I fret my string and it's exact and I know my bridge is properly placed. I highly recommend again if you feel uncomfortable adjusting your own intonation that you go to your local repair person and let them adjust that for you. Um, we'll discuss further the intonation process by using an electronic tuner which I will demonstrate to you in the next chapter. Okay now that was called that was that was for our bridge placement okay it is critical that your mandolin has proper bridge placement before we start learning to play otherwise you may be out of tune up the neck when you're talking about intonation what we're talking about is that the notes are true and clear and perfectly in tune from the first fret to the twelfth fret I can play a chord here I can move that chord up the neck and it still sounds in tune all the way up. Now if my bridge wasn't properly placed that chord wouldn't sound in tune all the way up. Let's talk about action issues. 
Now again, we had discussed action and what that means. That is uh, the distance of your strings above your fingerboard. If we take our action and make sure that as we play, let's say if you're pressing down here in the lower positions and you try it yourself, pressing down, because I know you're a beginner so you're not sure of what you're doing yet, but if you try pressing down and it feels really difficult to press down, then your action is more than likely too high. And what we're going to want to do is lower our action by, if you have a bridge that's adjustable, we'll just be taking our thumb screws here and going counterclockwise so that it lowers the top portion of your bridge. And in respect to doing that, what you'll end up with is a lower action on your fingerboard. Okay? Now, if the action happens to be too low, what you may encounter are buzzings. If you get a buzz, what happens is that it's more than likely that the string, when you're, when you're fretting it and you're getting a buzz, that means the string is too close to the frets in front of where you're fretting it. So, there again, we would go back to our adjustable bridge and we would raise the action. Now, there's a possibility you don't have an adjustable bridge, and in that case, I highly recommend that you take it to your local repair person so that you have a properly set up mandolin before we even start learning to play on it. I want it to be fun and easy to play, not to be frustrating for you to pursue the exercises and studies and techniques in this video. So, it's very important that our mandolin is properly set up. Uh, another thing to watch for on your mandolin are what we call worn out frets. Now, if you have a worn out fret, what you'll notice is right directly under the string, you'll see a little bit of a, an indentation on the fret itself. And if you have a worn out fret, it will be very difficult to tune it properly. So we want to make sure that our frets look new and they're not worn out. There may be just a little bit of wear and that's okay, but if you have a big indentation in that fret, you're going to want to take it to a local repair person so that your mandolin will play in tune and be easily tuned without any problems. In our discussion of proper setup, one of the most obvious issues are whether the strings are new or used. In other words, well used or well worn. If you have an older mandolin you're using for this video to learn on, you'll want to more than likely change out the strings because it's going to make it far easier to learn to tune with and to even sound better as you're playing, which can be far more inspiring than a string that sounds discordant with, let's say, your tuning with, let's say, your chords that you're playing. You don't want a discordant sounding mandolin. You want a mandolin with new, newer strings on it. And even before you adjust your intonation, you also want to have new strings, again, to make sure that you're adjusting the intonation properly. For if you adjust your intonation before you change out strings and your strings happen to be old and dead, then what happens is when you do put new strings on, you'll have to adjust that intonation again. Here we are in chapter two. What I'd like to discuss in this chapter is the importance of choosing the right types of strings, choosing the right pick, which is also called our medium, and a, which again is the approach to our mandolin and very critical to the approach of our mandolin, the choice of whether to use a strap or not, and instructional methods along with having a personal instructor. So let's start with choice of strings. Now, on strings, the main thing you want to do is make sure when you buy a new set of strings for your mandolin, or if you're buying a new mandolin, make sure that the strings that it comes with are light gauge strings. For if they're not light gauge strings, what you're going to do is find it far more difficult to fret the instrument because the thicker the gauge, the heavier the gauge of string, the more difficult it is for you to press down. Well, as a beginner, when you're first learning, what you're going to do is develop calluses on the tips of your fingers. Well, that can be very, a very painful process if you're not using light gauge strings already. Okay, now let's talk about choice of picks. What I have here are two different sizes of picks. Okay. Picks come in all different sizes. These are the most common size of picks. You have what we call the larger triangular and the smaller teardrop pick. These are the most common sizes of picks. Now, picks also come in what we call different gauges. 
just like strings. In this case, we have a thicker gauge pick here, and you can get these picks in a lot thinner gauge. I highly recommend you use a medium gauge to a thicker gauge pick. Otherwise, your pick will give you a slapping noise if it happens to be too thin of a pick. So you'll want to experiment and determine what size of pick fits you more comfortably, while still also making sure that whatever size you choose, that you do choose a medium thickness gauge or a heavier gauge. I recommend a medium gauge pick myself, and that's what I use myself. Now, the question about whether to use a strap or not. Now, as we are learning in this video, it's not required to have a strap because you can be sitting down as I'm doing here and you can easily play your mandolin sitting down with l allowing your knee no allowing your left leg to support the mandolin here you'll notice of course now if I was standing up that would be next to impossible so when you're standing up you will need a strap but to learn the mandolin, I highly recommend sitting down, taking your time, and not having to stand up just yet to play mandolin. And at a later date, after you feel somewhat accomplished on the mandolin, get yourself a strap and learn to play standing up also. But for this video, and as a beginner, it's only required that you learn to play sitting down, so a strap is not necessary. Even so, I highly recommend straps at a later date if you feel like you want to learn to play standing up or if you play in jam sessions or other types of bluegrass settings you'll definitely want a strap so you can stand up amongst the other players I'd like to discuss with you the choice of learning materials available to you there are many different media available such as books, videos um, there's even DVDs these days along with CDs from computer. My recommendation is to collect as many instruction materials as you can in book and video format, but to take your time and take one at a time and learn it thoroughly before moving up to more difficult levels of instructional material. So in this case what we want to do is lay the foundation with this video and hopefully give you the inspiration to pursue higher levels of playing and that way you'll be hopefully getting into this that way you also find that you'll get into more advanced material and take it methodically in a consecutive order building the foundation first and then learning more difficult types of music at a later date there are many different types of books and videos available for mandolin and all different styles of music. And of course now there are two classifications. There are methodology books and videos and there are song books and videos. As a beginner I highly recommend methodology books and videos because that focuses on technique building whereas the song books just build your repertoire. That is a collection of songs that you learn as you go along. You might want to try melbay.com, M-E-L-B-A-Y, for further instructional material. Here we are in Chapter 3. I'd like to discuss with you the use of tuning tools because our focus now in chapter three will be how to learn to tune our mandolin. Now you're going to have to be teaching yourself how to do that and the easiest way to learn quickly is to purchase an electronic tuner. Here we have a chromatic tuner that works very well for mandolin. I'm going to turn it on with a power button and if you'll notice you have LED lights and an LCD panel. Okay, That panel has an indicator needle if you'll notice, and you'll see it jumping around. And if I hit my G string, see the indicator needle goes up to the zero, and then the green light, the LED above it, turns on to green. If it was sharp, it would go above the zero, and if it was flat, it'd go below the zero. Okay? Now, this is an indispensable tool as a beginner. 
Learning how to tune will be far less frustrating if you make this purchase on an electronic tuner. <laughs> I feel like an advertisement. <laughs> the learning process I think is most difficult for us beginners when we're first learning to tune an instrument. Instead of having to go through the process of training your ear first before you can even learn to tune your instrument, the electronic tuner itself will give you a visual reference making the process far less difficult. Let's first tune our mandolin. Now, if you have an electronic tuner, you can use that as a reference. Or if you like, you can tune to the video itself. Now, to tune to the video itself, what I'm going to do is play each in string individually. The problem will be, of course, without having a trained ear, is di differentiating the different pitches from sharp to flat. As I pick my G string, I want you to tune your mandolin to the same pitch here. Both strings are tuned unison on the G strings. And these are called the G strings. This is your bass end of your mandolin. Now we'll go to the D strings. Now we'll go to the A strings. Now we'll go to the E strings. Okay, so far we have G, D, A, E. And keep in mind, each pair of strings are tuned in unison. They are the exact same note. Those are the same notes. Those are the same notes. Those are the same notes, and those are the same notes. Again, with an electronic tuner, this process will be far easier than trying to train your ear now to tune to the mandolin. And it is important to tune to my mandolin so that when you're following the exercises and the melodies through this video, your mandolin is in tune with my mandolin. As we are learning to, to tune our mandolin, I also would like to cover what we call relative tuning. That is, tuning the mandolin to itself. Okay? Now, when you play a G string here, after we've already, of course, referenced that G string and you feel like it's in tune to my mandolin, or if you have a piano or another guitar, you can also reference for the G open strings, you can tune your mandolin to itself simply by fretting the strings on the seventh fret and this means that the mandolin itself will be tuned in fifths. Okay, so if we take our G string and we've got that in tune, all we need to do is fret the string at the seventh fret. Okay, now the D strings will sound exactly like the G strings fretted at the seventh fret. Okay, now the A strings will also sound like the D strings at the 7th fret. The D strings are fretted now at the 7th fret, and our A strings will match up with that. Same thing is true for the E strings matching up with the A string on the 7th fret. Okay, so if you take your mandolin, and remember, each 7th fret on each pair of strings fretted should be the exact same note as the strings below it. That means you can tune the mandolin to itself called relative tuning. Relative tuning is good to know and I mean it is certainly important as you grow into learning to play mandolin. I don't expect you to learn it just yet. I really highly recommend the tuning tool what we call again the electronic tuner because this will facilitate the process of learning to tune much quicker. 
than trying to do it yourself before you have a trained ear. Here we are in chapter four, basic exercises. What we're gonna do is attempt to do our first left and right hand exercises. And in that process, what we wanna do is also learn proper positioning. Proper positioning is very critical to ensure that you do not develop bad habits, which are difficult to unlearn at a later date. Now let's take our right hand. Our right hand position should be, and is, as we discussed before, now we're gonna support our mandolin first between the legs, sitting down, with, with the left leg supporting the left side of the mandolin here, and then our right leg with the bout, the right side of the mandolin. Now, if you place your arm on top of the mandolin, such as this, you'll have a good right hand position, right forehand, right forearm position. If you place your forearm on the top right side of the mandolin, you'll have a perfect forearm position. Now, this should fall natural for you, and certainly you don't want to place your arm down by the tailpiece. You want to place it on the top of the mandolin, see? Now, we're, what we're doing is we're floating our hand here, and you want to use a loose wrist. Notice how my wrist is loose here, okay? Try this exercise. Just try this. Don't play any strings yet. Just move your hand back and forth, Open your hand, or if you want, you can close your hand. Either position is correct and considered correct. Now, if you take it and you, again, you're, you're supporting the forearm on the top of the mandolin. Okay, here we go. Okay, loosen that wrist. Do not try to do it this way on single notes. We'll do it this way only if we're doing a tremolo. Okay, and we'll get into that later. Right now, all we're trying to do is loosen our hand. Very loose here, see? A lot of wrist action. Okay, now there are many players who use different techniques such as supporting their hand with a little finger on the face of the mandolin. That's one approach and that also helps to give you better foundation. You can try that if you like, but mainly again is you want to ensure that your forearm is resting in the right position and you're, you're using a loose wrist as you play. Okay, now your first right hand exercise. What we're going to do is we're going to take the G string and we're going to play it four times and we're going to go all down strokes for now. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, if you're tapping your foot, you'll be counting to four while tapping your foot. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. What you're trying to do is keep an even tempo. Let's do it on the same thing on the D string. What you're trying to do is keep an even tempo. So that what you're trying to do is keep an even tempo. So as your music has a heartbeat itself, you are establishing that heartbeat with an even tempo. So you want to count one, two, three, four. You can count in your mind or out loud. And this exercise, this being your first exercise, is also will teach you how to move from string to string comfortably. Okay, that's your first right hand exercise. Our second right hand exercise involves what we call the and beat. So that after we learn to play all our down strokes, we're going to add an up stroke. Here we go, we're going to count four to four, one and two and three and four. So all your ands will be the upstroke of the flat pick. So here we go, one and two and three and four and. Now if you're, beat, if you're keeping the beat and the rhythm properly, what you have is no pause between the notes. You can be tapping your foot on the downbeats going one and two and three and four. There's your second right hand exercise. Keep doing that until you're very comfortable. Count the beats in your mind if you'd like, as opposed to counting out loud.
like to discuss with you your left hand position. Now, in learning to play mandolin, you want to develop good habits. So it's very critical that we first learn the proper position of our left hand. If you come in close, and I'll show you exactly how to hold your mandolin with your left hand. Now, what you want to do with the left hand, first and foremost, is to make sure that your thumb is behind the neck as mine is. Okay? You'll notice there, it rides on the top, but behind the neck. Okay? Now, if you were to take your thumb, and many players do this, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does limit your stretch. If you, do, if you place your thumb on top of the neck, what you'll find is a limit to how far you can stretch your little finger, because it does limit your stretch. It essentially will impede your facility in playing with your left hand. Although there are many good players who get by this, I highly recommend learning to play with your thumb on the top side of the neck, behind the neck, so that you can stretch your fingers very easily to any note you wish. Now for our first left hand exercise, what we want to do is again learn how to fret properly. Let's get back to our left hand here and notice the position being perfectly set up so that you gain all the reach you'd like by placing your thumb behind the neck. Okay, that's the first thing. Now we're not going to play with our right hand just yet. What I want to do is teach you how to properly fret these notes. Now when you're fretting a note, let's start with our G string here. What we're going to do is place our first finger on the second fret and press down. Now in the process of pressing that down, that note, you don't want to be touching any of the adjacent strings. You're just going to be fretting that particular note with the tip of your finger. Okay? Now to do that, you're going to press down lightly. You should not have to add too much force. And that, that would be your first exercise for fretting your instrument. Now what we want to do is do that on every string as we go down and make sure you're not touching adjacent strings because if once we learn to play chords you do not want to deaden the strings adjacent to the chord harmony. Okay, same thing with the second finger. Now again, we want to get as close as possible to the fret itself. You're not going to be over here, you want to be right by the fret, okay? Same thing. Tip of the finger, do not touch adjacent strings. Now, let's try adding these notes. Let's try playing with our right hand. I'm going to just play a downstroke with the right hand. And then you'll see that, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to count to four, just as we did in our right hand exercise, but we're going to add these notes. One, and then we're going to fret at the second fret, okay? And then we're going to fret with the second finger to the fourth fret, and then the third finger to the fifth fret. Okay, let's try that again. First finger, second fret. Second finger, fourth fret. Okay, there's, there's your exercise. What we want to do now is do all downstrokes. Now, that's, that's your first left hand exercise. If you feel ambitious, you can also add the little finger two more frets up, and that would really give you a strong foundation a, to, to learn to play with your left hand. So if we take it, and we add our little finger on the seventh fret. Now, I don't expect you to do this right away, but you can try it. Okay, we're going to go down stroke with our right hand, and we just keep doing this over and over, making sure we're getting nice, clear notes. Or if you, again, you want to just do it with three fingers, that's okay too. So there's your first left hand exercise. Now what we want to do is do that same pattern on all four strings. So we have, then we go to the D string. Then we go to the A string. Then we go to the E strings. 
There's your first left hand exercise that combines your right hand exercise with a downstroke. Now let's develop the right hand further. By, let's go back and look at the right hand. Now what we're going to do is we're going to count one and two and three and four and one and two. Now keep that rhythm going and let's add our left hand exercise. There you have it, your left and right hand exercises. If you work at those daily and take your time, and you'll find it far easier to learn to play more difficult passages as we go along in the video. So I highly recommend that you repeatedly practice those same exercises, both the left and right hand exercises, until you're very comfortable. to establish good rhythm. Good rhythm is critical to learning to play your mandolin. Now we're going to combine what we call chords with rhythm technique. Chords are when you're combining more than one note at one time, you have what we call a chord. Now, now we're not going to get into the theory of that, we're just going to do this here by our own technique. Here we're going to do, we're going to learn to play two finger chords. These are the easiest chords to learn on a mandolin when you're first starting out. Here we have a G chord. A G chord is with your first finger on the second fret A string and your second finger on the third fret G, E string. A G chord is with your first finger on the second fret of the A string and your second finger on the third fret of the E string. Okay, a G chord, if you strum down with your right hand, you have a beautiful harmonious G chord. Unless you've had trouble tuning your mandolin, it should sound like this. If it doesn't, you might want to go back to our tuning chapter and learn about tuning. There's your G chord. I want you to memorize that. You'll be playing that for many years to come. Now, we want to move both those fingers up one string. And again, be careful not to be touching adjacent strings as you fret those two notes. Okay? Here we are, fretting those two notes, and what you want to do is play them, again, strum them down, make sure each string is ringing out clear. Okay, that's your C chord, okay? Now we've learned our G chord, then our C chord, practice those two chords, once you're comfortable with those two chords, we're going to move on to our D chord. Our D chord is with our 2nd finger, 2nd fret, G string, 3rd finger, 2nd fret, E string. Okay, here's our D chord. Now I'm strumming very lightly with my right hand. And if you'll notice, all the notes ring loud and clear. And you may be getting, like, let's say, let's do an experiment here. You may be getting a sound like, if that is true, then what's happening is you're not pressing down hard enough and directly behind the fret. So if you look at your left hand, make sure you're right behind the fret and you're not touching adjacent strings and you're pressing down firmly but not too hard. There you have a D chord. Now we have three chords under our belt. We have a G chord, we have a C chord, we have a D chord. So now that we have our chords, let's talk about rhythm. We just finished learning our chordal exercise, which involves the G, the C, and the D chords. Now I'd like to combine that with rhythm technique. This is your chance to learn how to play proper rhythm on your mandolin. Okay. When you're playing rhythm, what you want to do, first and foremost, is learn to count, just like we did with our right hand exercise, so that we're counting to four. 
We're counting in fours because music itself is measured in four beats for the most part. Some measures, of course, are six beats and eight beats. It just depends. But in this case, we're going to focus on 4-4 four, four rhythm right now. 4-4 four, four rhythm involves counting to four, four quarter notes per measure. So that we have, we're going to count with our G chord now. We're going to take our G chord and we're going to count to four while tapping our foot. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. If you notice my right hand now is playing all down strokes. And we're trying to keep an even tempo. In other words, there are no pauses. We're not doing one, two, four. We're doing all even fours. Now let's move to our C chord and do the same thing. Making sure you're getting all the notes to ring clear. Now let's move to our D chord and do the same thing. Okay, that's your first rhythm using your first chord progression. Now, with the chord progression, what you also want to do is learn to keep a rhythm that feels more natural than that. Because when you're playing behind, let's say, somebody singing or another guitar or mandolin playing a lead, what you want to do is learn to be natural with your rhythm. So let's experiment with that. Let's take our 4-4 rhythm we just learned and let's try adding an upstroke, okay? Here we go. We're going to count to four. One, two, three, four. Now I'm on the G chord. Okay? Now let's count to four and I'm going to start adding the upbeat. One and two, three and four. 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 Now again, keep it methodical here. Keep it even tempo. One, two, and three. So we got one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one. Notice the ands were on an upbeat. One, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four. Now let's try our chord progression on the left hand using that same rhythm technique you just learned. We're going to go G, C, to D. One, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and... Again. Right hand. There you have it, the 4-4 four, four rhythm, okay? And that is establishing your first rhythm exercise. Now let's discuss other types of rhythm, just so that you're aware of them and that you can play within most any musical setting. We're going to learn how to play what we call three-quarter rhythm. That's waltz rhythm, okay? That's where you count to three instead of four. So we're going to emphasize the one and we're going to count to three by counting one two, three, one, two, three. Now let's add it with our chords. And I want to teach you another right hand technique right now. Now go to our right hand. And what I'm going to do is we're going to count one and we're going to hit the G string. See, one. Okay, and then the two, three, we're just going to strum two, three. So you have one, two, three, one, two, three. Now let's add it to our chord progression. Okay, we're going to go G, C, D again using that same technique. One, two, three, one, two, three. Let's go to our right hand and let's add in the upbeats as we did with the 4 4 rhythm. In this case, though, we're going to count 1, 2, and 3. So we're doing 1, 2, and 3. So we're doing 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so you have 1, 2, and 3. 
Now let's go to our left hand, let's add that same chord progression using that technique. You just learned the two most common rhythms found in music, both the 4-4 rhythm and the 3 quarter rhythm. 3 quarter rhythm meaning waltz rhythm. Now let's talk about chords again on the left hand. We just learned, now let's talk about chords on our left hand. We just learned the G, C, D chord progression for those exercises so that you can put, combine the elements necessary to understand both the right hand and left hand motion and the fact that rhythm is behind our techniques as we're learning this. So let's take our, if you have your left hand, again we're on a G chord here and we went to the C chord and we went to the D chord. What I want to teach you is at least four different keys for you to experiment with and combining all the exercises I already taught you on rhythm with the other chord progressions. So, so far we have the key of G is what we've learned, G, C, and D. Let's learn the key of C. The key of C would start on the C chord. Okay? The key of C would go C, and then it would go to an F chord. Now this might be a little difficult, but again, what, we, what you have is the first finger on the first fret of the E string, the second finger on the third fret of the D string, the third finger on the fifth fret of the G string. There's your F chord. Practice that. Try not to touch any adjacent strings. Make sure all the notes are ringing nice and clear before we go forward. Once you feel comfortable with that, and you may need to take a good half hour to learn this, maybe even a couple hours, take your time, learn that, and then we'll go forward. Then we'll go back to our C chord. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to play the C chord and go jump to the F chord. So you have C, F. Okay, just go back and forth until you're real comfortable. Because again, just like in our G chord progression, you don't want any pauses between changing the chords. So you have C, count to four, F, count to four. C, F. The last chord in our C chord progression would be the G chord, which you've already learned. Then you go back to the C chord. So all together you'd have on four beats each chord, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, now I want you to combine this chord progression with the rhythm exercises we learned on the G chord progression, which includes the 4 4 rhythm and the 3 quarter rhythm. There's your C chord progression, and you've already learned your G chord progression. Now I want you to learn your D chord progression. D chord progression starts out on the D chord, meaning it's in the key of D. Okay, we count to four, and then with the D chord from here we go to the G chord. Okay, so you have D, G. Our new chord for the key of D would be the A chord. This might be a little bit difficult. You're going to take your first finger and play it, place it on the second fret of the D string and your third finger on the sixth fret of the G string. And you play all four pairs of strings and you have an A chord. Make sure you're getting all your notes to ring through clear, no dead notes, and then go ahead and practice this for an hour or so until you're real comfortable with the A chord. I want you to memorize the A chord. After you've learned the A chord, now we're ready to do the D chord progression using, again, the same rhythmic patterns I taught you. If you do the 4-4 rhythm, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, okay? Then you go to, from the D chord, you go to the G chord, one, two, three, four, and then from the G chord, you go to the A chord. One, two, three, four. 
and then you go back to the D chord. These are all open chord positions that you're learning to establish your foundation and assist you in becoming an accomplished mandolinist. Okay, now we're going to add, let's, let's try our three-quarter rhythm with this. We're going to do one, two, three on the right hand. If you remember, our three-quarter rhythm is bass, one, and then two strums. So you have one, two, three, one, two, three. Now if we do it on the D chord progression, you have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And something I want you to understand about chords is that chords are essentially the backup of any type of song that you might play. It's good to know the chord progression so that a lead player can play in front of you while you're playing the chords, and then you can jump into the lead while they're playing the chords. It's the backbone of most any song. It's the harmonic rhythm that sets the backbone of any song. Now let's go to the last key I want to teach you is the key of A. Starts on the key, the A chord, which you've already learned, goes to the D chord, then it goes to a new chord, which is the E chord. Okay, the E chord is first finger, first fret, G string, third finger, second fret, A string. Okay? Now also you'll be putting your second finger on the D string, second fret. That's an E chord. Okay, that's an E chord. Now there's another way to do it. If you have a fat enough tips of your fingers, you can fret both these sets of strings with one finger, the tip of one finger, and have an E chord. Okay, now more commonly, of course, you'll be using two fingers for those notes. This is probably the most difficult chord you've learned to date but it is the last chord to learn in this video for now. So if we have an A chord progression, we have from here, then to the D chord, and then to the E chord, and then back to the A chord. Now again, apply your new rhythm techniques that I taught you, both the 4-4 rhythm and the 3-4 rhythm, to that chord progression. So if you're doing uh, the 4-4 four, four rhythm, we have 1, 2, and 3, 4, and 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 1, 2, and 3, 4, and... So all you have to do is keep repeating that until you're very comfortable and you don't even need to count in your head. You'll get to where you just become natural with the rhythm. There you have it, all four keys, we're talking G, C, D, and A. All four keys that allow you to learn your first rhythm exercise, and also you can apply all those chords to all different types of songs. I want you to experiment with that and determine what keys certain songs are in and try it for yourself. It's a lot of fun. Here we are in chapter six, right hand focus. Now what we're gonna do is again, go back to our right hand. Now what we're doing here, just so you understand where we're at with our mandolin instruction video, is we're establishing foundation by introducing exercise after exercise to ensure you're developing the technique first before we start to tackle our melodies and songs. And these exercises, you can live with these on your mandolin for many years to come because you can use them just to warm up before you start playing your mandolin. So let's start again with our right hand. This is right hand focus. Now, right hand focus, we're going to first learn what are called chord arpeggios. Okay, with chord arpeggios, what you want to do is get our G chord first 
and you remember the G chord, that's with the first two fingers, and we're just going to focus on arpeggios over that chord. Arpeggios are where you're going to... Arpeggios are a succession of notes played within the chord frame, but played separately as opposed to, let's say, strumming the chord. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add a pattern on the right hand that gives it a harp-like sound over the chord. Okay, that first pattern is an arpeggio, they call them arpeggios, and you're going to take your first G string and we're going to go G and then up on the A and then down on the D and then up on the E. Try that. Okay, then speed it up over your G chord. Okay, taking our G chord progression, now we're going to add the C chord and the D chord and we're going to play it just as we did with this pattern. Okay, let's take our right hand and let's play the G, C, D, right hand. Watch the right hand carefully now. C chord. D chord. G chord. C chord. D chord. G chord. Okay? So just keep repeating that until you're very comfortable with it. This pattern can be applied to all of our chord progressions we've learned to date on the video. So try it with all the chord progressions. Let's go to another pattern. We've so far learned this pattern here. Let's try a cross picking pattern. This means we're going to only take three strings, three sets of strings here, and we're going to go down, up, up. So we're doing down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up. And then we do it again. Okay, that's a cross-picking exercise. Now let's apply it to our G chord progression just like we've done before. Watch the right hand though. And you can vary the bass notes. So we can start on the G note. So we're doing... So we're doing down, up, up, down, so. So what I wanted you to do is now apply that same right hand technique to all the chord progressions we've learned, G, C, D, and A chord progressions. Okay, that was your cross picking exercise. Now let's learn a tremolo exercise. Tremolo is where we're playing a succession of notes all on one string or two sets of strings, but we're going to start on one set of string and we're going to take our right hand and we're going to move it rapidly back and forth so that it gives the note a sustain effect. See how that works? Now let's try it on all four pairs. That's a, that's a technique that's very common in mandolin playing and it allows the instrument to sustain itself as opposed to if you just played notes singly, notice how the sustain decays quickly. If you add the tremolo, you can hold that note for a longer period of time, almost emulating that of a violin. 
Okay, now let's take that tremolo exercise and let's apply it to the G chord and let's try learning to play a tremolo with two pairs of strings. So let's go to our left hand and you'll notice on the left hand we're doing a D chord. We're only going to fret these two sets of strings, okay? Now let's go to our right hand and let's do the tremolo based on that chord. We're playing both the E and the A strings together simultaneously. Okay, now I want you to take the left hand and I want to teach you a new chord which is a harmony note that we're going to play. From the G chord, we're going to move up our second finger to the third fret, second string, and our little finger on the fifth fret, okay, the E string. And that's our second chord, okay? So we have G, A, C. This is an A note, by the way, on the, that's why I said that. So you have G, A, and then we go to the B note here on the little finger. So you're just moving that, this chord up two frets and move it down to the G. Now let's combine that with our tremolo. Watch my left hand. You already know what, how to do your tremolo. Okay, now this same chord exercise here can also be applied, you can apply your cross-picking technique to it, and it sounds really wonderful. Here you go. On the right hand, if you remember, our cross-picking exercise involves a down stroke and two up. And then down up and then start over again. Now let's apply it to that same chord progression on the left hand. There you have it. On chapter six, we've learned how to focus on our right hand and build even further exercises to further our capability to learn to play the mandolin. And we've learned how to do arpeggios. We've learned how to do cross picking. We've learned tremolo. And we've learned even a new chord exercise with a harmony note on the high strings. Okay? Here we are in chapter seven, left hand focus. Now we're going to further our exercises on the left hand, again, to further develop our technique and facility with playing the mandolin. Our first exercise on the left hand is a very common technique that is used within melodies all the time, and that is called hammer-ons. Hammer-ons is where you're going to take the note, you're going to play the note, let's say, on the string, open, we'll start with open, and then we're going to hammer our finger down on that note which is going to give it a second note without having to pick it. Now, if you'll come in, if you'll watch both my right and left hand here, I'm going to do a hammer-on pattern here. Okay, now I'm hammering on. Okay, so a hammer-on is where you're picking the note once and then you're hammering with your left hand. So I don't expect you to learn this right at this moment, but I want you to be familiar with this technique as a mandolinist. Okay, when you're doing a hammer-on, let's, let's take our first finger, second fret here, and we're going to hammer-on our second finger here after we pick the note on the first finger, second fret G string. Pick the note and then hammer. 
Okay, we're hammering to the fourth fret with a second finger. Okay, here's the exercise. Okay. Okay, that's a hammer on exercise. So we're doing hammer here, and then we're taking the open D string and we're hammering the first finger, second fret D string. And then we're playing the D string open. There you go. Notice how ghostly the second note sounds. It doesn't sound at all like you're picking it with your pick, because you're not, yet your left hand itself is playing the note. Now let's talk about pull-offs. A pull-off is where you're going to take your finger and you're essentially going to be pulling the finger off and creating the second note without picking it. See? I'm taking the third finger on the fifth fret of the A string and I'm pulling off while keeping my second finger fretted on the fourth fret. Okay, pull-off. How about a hammer-on pull-off? See, so you can combine these left hand techniques, but they're very commonly found most in most all mandolin music, and I want you to become familiar with hammer-ons, pull-offs, and later slides. So let's do the hammer-on, pull-off, and then you can also, see so you can do a hammer, pull-off at the same time. Okay, so if we did, a hammer on here. We could also pull this note off. So if we could do on our first exercise. So you could do hammer, pull, and it plays the note without having to pick the note. Let's go to both hands now and watch as I play this hammer pull off exercise. See, I'm pulling on, on both those fingers. And I want you to experiment and just try different variations on your own and just keep hammering and pulling off till you're very comfortable with that technique. See, here's a pull off with two fingers and I'm pulling off from the fifth fret to the second fret. And then I'm pulling off from the second fret to the open string. about the slide. We've just discussed the hammer-on, the pull-off, and now we're going to discuss the slide. These are the three main techniques of the left hand to add flair and add flavor to your melodies. In other words, if you're playing a simple melody and you just picked every note out, see that's picking every note, but what if you add hammer-ons and pull-offs? See how it sounds different. See? So these are the techniques I want you to learn. Now let's talk about sliding the note. Now slide, let's take our second finger and we're going to slide up to the third fret. So we got okay, let's take this exercise very slowly now. We're going to slide. Okay, slide up, play these notes here, and then we're going to pull off here, pull off here. 
So you have. So the main thing what I'm trying to teach you here is to combine all three left hand techniques so that you can develop your own exercises. You can experiment and try different variations. This is really relatively advanced technique. So I don't expect you to learn it all at once, but I do want you to be familiar with this. So as we progress, you can come back to this portion of the video and de determine where you'd like to fit in these three different techniques, including hammer-ons, pull-offs, and slides. So you can do, you can combine all three techniques into one lick. You have slide, pull-off, and hammer-on, see? To further our left hand technique, what we want to do next is to learn scales. Also in learning scales, we'll be able to, after learning scales, combine those scales to play melodies and make it easier to learn to play a melody. So our first scale will be the G scale. The G scale involves playing from the first finger on the second fret to the fourth fret to the fifth fret. So you have, those are the first four notes. Okay? And then you do the same thing on the D string. So you have all together on one octave G scale you'd have. Now let's go to our right hand and let's combine, if you remember, our down up. And let's combine it with this scale slowly now. Watch our scale now on the left hand. Here we go. And then we go backwards. And try it again. And let's see. Okay, now we're gonna now we're gonna take the G scale and we're gonna move it up to the G note on the E string. So we start with a G note on the D string here. And then we go open A, second fret, first finger on the A string, second finger, third fret, third finger, fifth fret, open E, first finger, second fret, G. So if you combine both those scales and you walk it all the way up using your down up stroke, you have a full G scale in the open position. using your down up stroke. There's your G scale. Now see this kind of exercise, if you keep doing it over and over, you're going to find it far easier to learn your first melody. Okay, that's your G scale. Let's talk about our C scale. C scale starts on the fifth fret G string. That's the C note. It starts on a C note. So you take your C note, then you walk it up to the D open, then your first finger, second fret, D string, second finger, third fret, D string, and then your third finger, fifth fret, D string, and then your open A string, then your second fret, first finger, and then your second fret, third fret, that is, second finger. So you have all together. Try that again. Now let's combine our down up picking pattern. Let's go to our right hand. One and two and three and four and we're on the C note on the left hand. Watch our left hand. Now we're gonna walk it up all the way up to the top C. You have
let's take a step back and let's do it with a G scale again. Okay, and do it slowly. There's your G scale. Now let's do our C scale. Now let's learn our D scale, which is a similar pattern to the G scale, but starts on the D string. So it's D open, first finger, second fret, second finger, fourth fret, third finger, fifth fret, open A, first finger, second fret, second finger, fourth fret, then third finger, fifth fret. Okay, that's your D scale. So, so far we have a G scale, then we have a C scale, now we have a D scale, and the last scale I'd like you to learn is the A scale, starting with your first finger, second fret on the G string, and then second finger, fourth fret, third finger, sixth fret of the G string, open D string, first finger, second fret D string, second finger, fourth fret, D string, third finger, sixth fret, D string, open A, first finger, second fret, A string, second finger, fourth fret, A string, third finger, fifth fret, A string, open E string, first finger, second fret, E string, second finger, fourth fret, E string, fifth, fifth fret with the third finger. So, so far we have on the A scale you have Now let's combine that with our down-up pattern on the right hand. So you have, starting on the A note, okay, let's do our scale, let's do it slowly. Keep it even and methodical, no pauses. Okay, let's go to our scale now, are you ready? Now you've learned four scales all together. What I want you to do is take these scales, play them repeatedly until you become very comfortable before we move on to the next chapter, your first melodies. Here we are in chapter nine, your first melodies. Now, since we have a good foundation by learning all these exercises applied to both the right and left hand, we should be more comfortable about playing our first melody. Our first melody will be Dixie. Okay, in Dixie, we're gonna be playing in the key of D. You learn the D scale, which on the left hand follows this pattern. And then, of course, on this song, we're going to add a few more notes on the high end. Okay, there's your D scale. Now, to play Dixie, what we want to do is we're going to learn how to play first just the melody by itself with down strokes so that you have, we're going to take it, so you're, okay, take it from the left hand. We're going to first learn the first few notes of Dixie by concentrating, playing on the fourth fret, second finger, and then start, and that's our starting note. And we're going to walk it down to the first finger and then open. This is part of your D scale, if you remember. So it makes it easy to learn the melody. Okay, now this is down, up, down. Okay, so when you're playing on your right hand, you're going down, up, and then it's open. That way you, the and stroke, if you remember, is the upbeat of the melody. So you have one and two, three, four, one and two, three, four. Remember that now. So we remember that all our ands will be up strokes and our downbeat will be down strokes. So coming back to the melody, we have, and that's open, all down stroke. Okay, now that's part of the D scale again. We're just walking that D scale up using down, up, down, up, stroke.
Okay, now watch both my hands as I play that same passage. That was just a little experiment there. <laughs> what I want you to do though, with this passage is again, you learn each passage individually. We've learned that part. And watch how my right hand is going down up on the up beats. One and two, three. See, now I'm hitting both sets of strings and it harmonizes the melody. Now, the second part. The second part is uh, starts on the open A, so you have... Let's go to our left hand and let's look at this real closely here. So you know exactly which notes to be playing. You're going to go one and two, three. So you have one and two. You're taking your right hand, one and two. And then the first finger on the E string, open on the A. That's open E. Our second melody involves the tremolo technique that we learned in an earlier lesson. If you recall, the tremolo technique is where you take a succession of notes and you play them together with your flat pick. Okay, now we're going to take a melody called Shenandoah and we're going to play it with a tremolo. And you'll see how important it is to gain the sustain that you do with the tremolo to ensure that your notes are longer than they would be if you played them singly. So if you have Shenandoah, we start with, again, here let's start with the left hand and let's learn the melody first. So, and then we'll concentrate on the right hand. Okay, that's an open G and then fifth fret on the third finger. Okay, now remember this is in the key of C. If you remember your C scale, this will be very easy to learn. Let's go through our C scale and memorize that pattern where the fingers fall. Because where the fingers fall will also dictate the melody of Shenandoah in the key of C. Okay, so we have open G and then three notes here on the fifth fret with the third finger. Then we walk it up like we do the C scale and then we do then open A and then 5th fret, 3rd finger on the D string. That's the A string, 2nd finger, 1st finger. Okay, now you got the melody, you have all the notes, and they did fall right in with the C scale that you learned earlier. Now if you take your tremolo, let's go to our right hand, and let's try a tremolo on this. What we're going to do is you play a couple notes, and then you add your tremolo as soon as you fret the note. So if you're doing, so you're taking the note, you're playing it one time, and then you're taking the tremolo while you fret it with the fifth fret with your third finger. 
Okay, now, you see, see where the tremolos are falling into place? I want you to watch both hands as we play Shenandoah with added tremolo in different parts of the song to ensure sustain. To further our studies in the first melody section, what I'd like to do now is concentrate on a melody that falls in the key of G. This would be Beethoven's Ninth. Very simple melody, but also very infectious melody. Here we go. We're going to start with the left hand, and we're going to learn to play off of the G scale, starting on the B note on the A string, which is the second fret of the A string. And we're just walking it up all down strokes on this one. So you're taking first finger, second finger, third finger. Hit twice, two notes on the first. Then we're going to walk down here to the G note. Second part is open A. That's open D. Okay, now I want you to watch both hands so you can see the pick direction of the melody. Now, for experiment, try adding a harmony while you're playing that. See, what I'm doing is I'm just adding the 5th fret 3rd finger D note, and it really harmonizes the melody. And I'm hitting both courses of the strings. If you'll notice, I'm doing all down strokes with the right hand. So, it's, so you're just doing this, all down strokes. And then we're going to add the melody on top of this. Are you ready for the left hand now? We're going to take it, and we're taking two notes here at the same time. And then I'm adding the second finger, just like the melody, and then the fourth finger, where we had put our third finger before. See? And then the next phrase would be and then back to the harmony. See how that works? You can experiment on your own and try different harmony notes. You can even ride on the top using your original G chord. See, and that would be a little bit tricky though, but you can do that. See, 
a lot of ways to harmonize melodies and all I wanted to do is experiment to show you that there's a lot of ways and directions you can take your mandolin In chapter 10, I'd like to cover a new technique called fiddle tune style mandolin. This is where we adapt fiddle tunes to the mandolin. Let's start with the left hand. And what we want to do is take our D scale, you remember that scale, and we're going to learn a tune called Arkansas Traveler. And this one it starts off with the open D string and then we fret on the second finger with the the Arkansas Traveler starts on the open D string and then we fret with the second finger on the fourth fret and then the first finger on the second fret. See, and it falls in the D scale pattern. Now we're going to take our second finger and put it up on the fourth fret of the G string. Now I'm going to hammer on, if you remember our hammer on technique. A lot of variations here. But let's, let's take it slowly and let's do it one note at a time and look at both hands now. In Arkansas Traveler, what we want to do is learn the A part first, which falls on the D string open. See? And watch the pick angle now. We're always doing the upstroke on the ambi. One and two and... our left hand and let's do this very slowly. You saw the pick angles on that one passage. We only played it up to speed so you could see the pick direction on each note. Now we're going to take just our left hand. You just want to focus on the left hand and play it slowly. So we got passage here is so there you have the A part the second part B part would be piece again you can experiment and try having your hammer-ons for instance right here okay there you have 
Arkansas Traveler. Now on Soldier's Joy, what you want to do is get the shuffle rhythm going so you kick it off. And then the first three notes will take a down up stroke with the right hand and walk down our second to first finger on the A string. So we have Let's try that again. Now watch both hands while I do this. We're going to take it and we're going to play so you can get your pick direction while you're playing the melody. So we have shuffle. Look at our left hand and let's talk about the second part to Soldier's Joy, the B part. Now what we're doing is we're walking up the fingers here. Okay, we're just walking up, but we're strumming three pairs of strings from the D, A to E. We're strumming all three of those. And then we're taking the open strings. See? So we're doing taking a G chord here. Okay, you know the G chord. So let's take it from the beginning. So you can take it singly or you can take it with a double note pattern doing a down up stroke. Two variations of that. Now let's take it from the very beginning and watch slowly as I play the whole song and we're going to play it relatively slow. Second part. Or whatever's easier for you. So from the very beginning, let's watch both hands and let's play it again. And you can also, by the way, let's look at the left hand again. I wanted to show you the hammer on. See, we're, we can kick off just doing the shuffle rhythm. We can also add a hammer on while we're doing the shuffle rhythm. Okay, let's watch both hands. Let's play this through here.
next fiddle tune, let's learn Devil's Dream. This fiddle tune will focus on the A scale. Now, on the left hand, let's try this exercise. It's a great exercise, by the way. Just the melody itself also falls into the same category as I would call an exercise because it really works your hands on these three notes. If you'll notice right here, And what we're going to do is we're going to play these two notes and then we're going to lift up the fingers and play it open. So you have... So here we have Devil's Dream. Let's look at our right hand and let's try Devil's Dream and you have the, so you're doing down, and then we're gonna go down, up, just like I taught you, with a four four rhythm. Now let's look at both hands. Just do that over and over so until you're really comfortable just with that one passage. Once you're comfortable with that, we can move on. So let's take it from the beginning, we have... So now here's a tricky one. What we're doing is we're essentially putting our first finger on the second fret and we're barring the notes. So we're barring these notes here. So when we do this... So we're barring these two notes. Now I'm using the tip of my finger to do it, but you can also do it this way, where you're barring them. Try this exercise over and over. This is the down, up, picking motion. So we have... That's from the D string. Okay, let's look at both hands now, that same passage. Let's look at both hands here. Okay, second part. second part at the left hand close up here. Here we go. Now the second part, we're essentially lifting up this finger and then playing the A open. And we're repeating the E string open as we're playing these notes. That's the fourth fret, second finger on the A string. Just keep doing that over and over until you're comfortable with it. Then go back to your other exercise where the other passage we we did this number here, back to the 4th fret, see that's just an exercise in itself. Okay, from the beginning, let's look at both hands and let's play Devil's Dream from the beginning. We have kick off, all down. So you can do, and I like to do an open note before I jump in there with the fifth fret, third finger.
staying in the key of A, let's learn Old Joe Clark. Again, it all falls within the A scale. Now, there is a note called the G note that gives it a modal flavor, so that flattens the A note on the seventh tone. But we don't need to get to the theory of it, but I want you to listen to it. We'll start off with a simple melody, and I want you to watch both hands as we play the melody very slowly. Here we go. Okay, now let's take and focus on the left hand so we see where all those notes fall into place. We're playing the open E string, first finger, second fret, second finger, third fret. That goes to the A string, fifth fret, and the fourth fret. I'm hitting both A and E strings as I walk these down. Okay, and then we do the melody again on the A part. Now how about let's try to add our shuffle rhythm. both hands now. so you can speed it up and play it as fast as you like but again adding the shuffle rhythm certainly created the rhythmic pattern in the heartbeat of the whole melody and all we're doing is doing the shuffle rhythm which I taught you earlier and adding it to that simple melody Now let's do a fiddle tune that's a great beginner's piece for mandolin called Boil Them Cabbage Down. This one will give you an exercise for your chordal positions starting on the A chord. If you recall we did the A chord here and then what we're going to do is we're going to play the A chord. We're going to move up to our second finger on the fourth fret D string and our little finger on the seventh fret G string. So you have and then we're going to combine that with a rhythmic pattern. So we have uh, Okay, 
so there's this chord here of course again we're using we're fretting two pairs of strings with one finger now you can if you like use two fingers to fret those see like that if you like or I myself use one finger okay but let's go back to the tune and we're doing it in a chordal pattern Okay, so what you're doing is you're starting out in the A chord, and you're just all you're doing is playing the shuffle rhythm, and you're walking back down, and then you're playing the, and that's where we fret both sets of strings. Okay. Let's try a uh, cross picking exercise using that same chord pattern. Now take our right hand and look at how we can take a forward or, or in fact, well let's do our backward roll cross picking technique. Remember that one? That's our backward roll using cross picking technique. Right over the A chord. Now let's take our chord, let's use that back that same cross picking pattern, let's add it to the chordal pattern we just learned for Boiled and Cabbage Down. Here we go. Watch both hands. Where do you go from here with your mandolin? I believe that you should let your musical taste lead you. Try to stay inspired by practicing daily. Don't become discouraged by attempting to play over your head. Take your time and play at a level that is comfortable for you so that you feel confident about moving on to more difficult pieces. To increase your technique daily, I highly recommend pursuing all the exercises we covered and practicing them daily not to forget them at all, and to try to keep a list of exercises and tunes that you already know. Play them all daily without reserve. This will keep you familiar with what you've already learned and only increase your technique on the mandolin. What to listen to? I'd like to encourage you to purchase as many mandolin recordings as you can get your hands on. Keep a discography of all your recordings, which should include the, the mandolinist name of each tune, along with the artist. What I'm talking about here is to create your own logbook of all of the recordings you have and log in all the names and then as you listen to those tunes and let's say the entire recording, see if you can name each tune as they're being played so that you memorize traditional standards. Some of the artists that I'd recommend listening to include Ricky Skaggs, Norman Blake who's a great guitarist and mandolinist, Bill Monroe, Red Rector, Jimmy Gaudreau, Doyle Lawson, Sam Bush, Chris Teeley, and one of my all-time favorites, David Grisman. The importance of focus practice. What is focus practice? Focus practice is something that we covered to some degree through some of our lessons on this video. Mainly, you want to bracket time daily to your practice schedule. If you can't afford more than one to two hours, at the very least, set aside 30 minutes daily unconditionally. This way, you're always advancing on a daily basis. One morning, you'll wake up as an accomplished mandolinist just because you focused your practice. Be sure to have a roadmap to practice with. This is number two. In other words, when you sit down to practice, have your sheet music in front of you, have your goals and objectives in front of you, something that will keep you on track and allow you to measure your progress. This can mean having a particular piece of sheet music in front of you or a video to play along with that will keep you focused on a particular technique or tune you're trying to accomplish. Again, a lot of it is having your goals and your objectives in front of you. 
Number three, keep a practice journal with you so that you can include everything that you've accomplished. Scales, exercises, all the songs you've learned on this video, including all the fiddle tunes. Fiddle tunes are great to keep a song list on because fiddle tunes, they go on and on and on and they, they essentially are structured where there's an A and a B part. Once you've learned one fiddle tune in one key, it becomes easier and easier to learn other fiddle tunes. In continuing your mandolin journey, I hope you found this video to be fun and inspiring. It should only be one addition to your very own larger library of books and videos. I urge you to start amassing your own library of anything mandolin related, including songbooks, method books, videos, and CDs. Be sure to check with melbay.com, M-E-L-B-A-Y.com for many other mandolin learning materials. In closing, I'd like to say one more thing. Your mandolin journey is uniquely yours. No two mandolinists in history have ever played exactly alike. Everyone is an individual with their own art form and approach to the mandolin. So be yourself, which is far easier than being someone else. Listen to your own sojourn. Even though you may follow the path of other mandolinists by learning their arrangements and techniques, feel free to explore from your vantage point as a unique artist. This way, you'll discover your very own path through your mandolin explorations and ultimately find your own style and approach. It's easy to be easy when you're easy.